Okay. Okay. Good evening, students. Uh, so I believe that uh, during the last class we just studied about we one minute. I just admit nine as well. Let me see. So, yeah. okay. so last class we learned about the theories of law and also I touched upon the sources of law. Now, what are the sources of law? One is, of course, we spoke about legislation. That means the laws which are made by the legislature. So legislature is a body which makes laws. So we can say that legislature legislates. So legislature legislates legislation. So legislature is the one who makes the laws. So one of the sources of law that is contemporary source of law is, of course, the legislature. Then we have the judicial precedents as one of the sources of law. Now, judicial precedents are basically court cases or judgments passed by the courts, where normally the trend is just in simple words that the, the, the judgment of the higher court is binding on the lower court. That means whenever the judges handle cases, so they are bound by the decisions of the higher court. Like for example, I was just going through even in Somalia, I believe that you have the highest court in Somalia as a Supreme Court, which is in Mogadishu, right? So the Supreme Court of Somalia is the highest court of the land. Then apart from that, of course, you have the high court and at the lower level, you have the district courts and the other small courts, jurisdictional courts, which handles both civil and criminal matters. So the, 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 the judgment laid down or the judgment adjudicated or the case that is adjudicated and by the Supreme Court and where it lays down a judgment that is called a judicial precedent. Okay, and that is binding on the lower court. So normally judicial precedents are the, you know, the judgments of the court. So ju judicial precedents also form an important aspect of law and they are also a kind of a source of law, especially if it is the common law jurisdiction. Common law jurisdiction like England, Australia, they're normally called as, uh, you know, the, the major chunk of the laws are basically the judge-made laws or they come from or they emanate from judicial proceedings. So therefore, we say that judicial proceedings also form a part of the source of law. So that is contemporary part. That is, uh, you know, legislature, uh, sorry, legislation, uh, of course, legislature or legislation is a source of law. Ju judicial proceedings is a source of law. Apart from that, we have customs, traditions, usages, that is whatever customs are put forth. Sometimes they, you know, like for example, we have different communities, different religion, and every religion puts has its own culture, it's got its own tradition. And for example, the best example of this is marriage. So what, how a marriage is cons considered to be a legal marriage. So every, uh, you know, every religion has its own, uh, you know, tradition and practices. And so that is actually codified and it comes, it's formulated into a, a law today. And so we have like, you know, the Islam, Islamic law, we have the Christian laws or the canon laws. And um, you have those who are Hindu, especially in India, they have the Hindu laws like Hindu Marriage Act 1955 and so on. So these are the examples of, you know, laws which are come down from customs or usage or traditions or practices. So apart from that, other sources of law are, of course, what are the other sources? Of course, we have the constitutional law of the land, which even Somalia has constitution. So it, it operates as a grand norm. That is like it's a basic law from which all other laws operate. In the sense, any laws that are made and it goes against the constitution of that particular nation or country, that means that law has to be struck down as bad because they will be considered to be as unconstitutional. So constitution of any country for that matter is also considered to be as a source of law. So likewise, there are different sources of law. And uh, in today's chapter, we will, uh, you know, discuss about the doctrine of judicial proceedings, that is how, uh, 
uh, or what role does precedence or this court cases the judgments of the court cases how they play a role and what is important what are the important factors or the components in uh, in this particular doctrine uh, that is the doctrine of judicial precedent and apart from that we will uh, just delve into the theory of legal realism just will you know just go through it we'll brush through it and also we will go through legal reasoning okay so having this at the perspective let's move further So as we said earlier in today's class, we are going to study three important aspects. One is legal realism as a theory, legal reasoning and doctrine of precedence. In chapter two, what is important is just these three factors. There are other things called as indeterminative factor and so on. That is something which cannot be determined easily. So uh, you can just run, th just read through it through our textbook. It's not a problem, but what is important for you in this chapter is legal realism as a theory, legal reasoning and doctrine of precedence. What is legal realism? So this is one of the theories. Legal realism is one of the theory. Now, legal realism is a theory that believes that all law springs from prevailing social interests and public policy. I understand me. That means they say that they are basically practical thinkers. Legal realis realism, the, the theorists of legal realism were considered to be as realists or practical thinkers, the theory is based on naturalist philosophy of law, and they believe that laws spring from prevailing social interests and public policy. What they're trying to say is here, when the judge adjudicates a matter or when a judge handles a particular matter before the court, he is not just to consider just the rule of law as it is or the principles of law of that particular law, of that particular case, under the facts and circumstances of that particular case, but he's also supposed to consider what is the, 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 the actual situation at hand, the circumstances at hand, and the practical application of, of the law with those circumstances. So what legal realists believe is, they're saying that laws may be available and also spring from the prevailing social interest and public policy. And this theory was actually propounded in 1881 by Oliver Bendel, who was a judge, Holmes Jr., when he published the common law. So this theory actually attacked the traditional view of law. The most remarkable factor in legal realism theory is that the belief that the courts can appropriate or use rules and principles in a logical and objective manner to the extent that aids or support adjudication of the matter before the court. So that's what, what they're trying to say here is, it is trying to give a leverage to the courts or to the judges saying that, who just need not you know, apply the law as it is, just crisply as it is, but you can have the leverage of interpreting the law and go a little bit beyond and try to apply it to see how it applies to the circumstance in hand in the best interest of rendering justice. So it says, therefore, that you apply even logical, you be logical in the application, be objective in application, and then apply it in your decision while you're adjudicating any matter before the court. So therefore, this is a remarkable factor of legal realism where they are considered to be practical thinkers. And they say that law is just not to be applied as it is, but it's also there is something to be thought beyond under the facts and circumstances of any case that comes before the court. Now, these realists believe that judges are not expected to, to you know, decide on matters or cases formally, just in a, you know, in a formal manner, but apply principles as they are. They also believe that laws are made and are not found. And further, that judges are to consider not only abstract rules, but also social interests and public policy while handling the matter or while adjudicating a matter before the court. So that means this theory encourages the use of interpretation and discretionary powers by the court. 
That means they want the courts or they want the judges to interpret the laws, to go beyond the letter of the law, but remain within the spirit of the law. Are you understanding? To go beyond the letter of the law, but remain within the spirit of the law. To remain within the purpose and the aim of the law, but you can go beyond what is written, to read between the lines, to interpret the meaning of the law, and to see how it is applicable in a particular situation. Be within the purview of the aim and the purpose of the law. That means to go beyond the letter, but be within the spirit of the law. So therefore, it encourages the use of interpretation and the discretionary powers by the courts. So legal realists actually regard law as a mechanism to also promote human rights and justice. Now, they regard law to achieve, you know, uh, as an instrument that achieves justice by being malleable and using the law interpretatively to serve justice. Malleable in the sense one which can be molded in any form. So they are saying that law should be malleable and it should be used interpretatively to serve the ends of justice. There are five sub schools under the school of thought that is legal realism and they are power in economics and society. So they are saying that while your adjudicating matter also consider the economics of the society, the economy of the society, the power economics of the society, at what level the society is. So accordingly, you adjudicate matters. Next is persuasion and characteristics of the individual judges. It also takes into consideration the characteristics of the individual judges. Apart from that, the society's well-being, practical approach to achieve a sound judgment and amalgamation of legal philosophies, amalgamation in the sense that is synchronization of legal philosophies. So there are five sub schools, again, and repeating power in economics and society, persuasion and characteristics of individual judges, society's well-being, practical approach or pragmatic approach to achieve a sound judgment. You can also call it as a pragmatic approach to achieve a sound judgment and amalgamation or synchronization of legal philosophies. Next, we will move on to legal reasoning. Now, theories of legal reasoning are primarily normative theories. Now, legal reasoning basically is a technique of thought, an argument used by legal practitioners, lawyers, and judges when applying legal rules to a specific, specific situation in their discourse or in their seminars or in their lectures or in their talks. So basically, it is like, what is the reasoning or the foundational principle or the, the rationale behind the law. So legal reasoning basically is, a, is the rationale behind a particular law while using those legal principles. So legal reasoning is a deductive analysis. It is a deductive analysis of drawing conclusions or the highlights that, that merit how the analogy is drawn in a case or the highlights of the merits of the analogy drawn in a case. So the process basically involves interpretation of facts, evidence of the case, that is the proof that matters, and may involve even a recommendation, depending upon the facts of the case and the conclusions drawn. So here basically laws are actually applied to facts and then conclusions are drawn. Now, legal reasoning may be classified into the following. It is basically, it has five basic classification. Rule-based reasoning, that is, which is most significant form of reasoning. Next is, uh, you know, reasoning by analogy, that is by finding similarities or common factors. Then distinguishing cases, which is opposed to reasoning by analogy. And policy reasoning, and inductive reasoning, which is also called cause effect reasoning or causation reasoning. That is, there is a cause of something that has had some effect on something. So this is a causation theory, cause effect. So that is inductive reasoning. So what is a doctrine of precedent? This is a very, very important doctrine and you can expect this for your exams. It's a very important question, doctrine of precedent. And uh, because this is something that every lawyer uses and normally it is used by the courts. So this is something very important which every law student must know. What is the doctrine of precedent? Precedent, as you know, a simple meaning of it is something which has taken place in the past. So 
it, it is used as an example today. So that's a precedent. So what is judicial precedent? Judicial precedent, simply speaking, it is uh, just the judgments which are laid by the higher courts, which are used by the lower courts. So the doctrine of precedent basically plays a very important role in the English common law system. So what is this judicial precedent? Free dictionary defines precedent as an act or instance that may be used as an example in dealing with subsequent similar instances. So what is important here is that when the precedents are used, they have to be used uh, when you take examples of previous cases, that means it has to be used in similar circumstances, not in different circumstances, but in similar circumstances. If there is a matter before the court, which is like, you know, similar, which has similar circumstances, similar facts. So it is at that time that the judges of the lower court or equal jurisdiction can apply these, uh, you know, the judgments of the higher court or even of equal jurisdiction of the other court. So law, a judicial reasoning in law that is binding on other equal or lower courts in the same jurisdiction as to its conclusion on a point of law, and may also be persuasive to courts in other jurisdiction in subsequent cases involving sufficiently similar facts. So what's important here is the facts must be sufficiently similar. It may not be used in dissimilar uh, cases, that is cases which are not related to each other, cases the facts of which are not similar to each other, but it is used in cases where cases are, you know, the facts of the cases are similar to each other. Next is judicial precedent now is also source of law. That's what we said earlier. If a question is asked, what are the sources of law? So the contemporary sources of law, of course, are legislature, that is the body which makes laws. Then it is the uh, I mean, uh, judicial precedence, that is the judgment law, and of course, customs, traditions, and also international treaties. So this is one of the source of law. So judicial precedent is a source of law where past decisions are referred to by the judges for guidance in future cases, which means it is a process whereby judges follow previously decided cases which have similar facts. So the basic principle here is that the lower courts are bound to follow the decision of the higher courts. So this is based on the principle of stair decisis. Listen to me carefully. So this is very important. This is based on the principle of stare decisis. Are you understanding? So this is stare decisis based upon the principle of stare decisis, which is a Latin term, which means stand by decided matters. Stand by decided matters. Stare decisis means stand by decided matters or stick to the matters that are decided earlier. So but thereby, cases of similar nature are expected to be adjudicated or resolved or handled before the court in a similar manner or pattern, thus their decisis is intertwined, that is, it is intermingled or intertwined with the principle of judicial precedence. Judicial precedent may be binding precedent or it may be persuasive precedent. So judicial precedence can be bifurcated into binding precedent and persuade persuasive precedent. What is binding? Binding by the very, uh, you know, the term that is used, binding, that means it is the lower courts are bound by the decision of the higher court. For example, the, 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 the decision of the Supreme Court of Somalia is binding on the lower courts. So persuasive precedent is a precedent which is not binding, but it is persuasive in nature. That means the courts may uh, not mandatorily bind themselves to it, but it may use it to persuade them to come to a particular conclusion in any particular case. So judicial precedents are bifurcated into binding precedent and persuasive precedent, or even, you know, you have, apart from persuasive precedent, you have persuasive authoritative texts, for example, foreign judgment or, you know, foreign articles or, you know, like it is just like to draw some uh, conclusion or inference on how if there has been a similar case elsewhere in any other part of the world, then if, you know, the lawyer brings it before the judge and says, see, in this particular case, in such and such part of the world, the lawyer there put it before the judge and the judge has drawn such and such a conclusion and thereby the lawyer normally pleads before the court saying that you also judge, like, you know, you also try to 
you know, go forward with this particular decision. So that is persuasive if it is taken place in some other part of the world. But if it is in the same country and it is from the higher court to the lower court, that means this kind of a decision or precedent is binding. So binding precedents, therefore, are those decisions which are binding on the courts. The decision of the higher court is binding on the lower court within a jurisdiction that is within a particular area. So persuasive precedents are those decisions which may provide insight and may not be mandatory to be utilized in a particular case, however, which are persuasive. For example, foreign judgments, such precedents may or may not be applied. Now this, I'm reiterating here, uh, precedents or the doctrine of precedent revolves around the concept of stare decisis. Stare decisis is a legal principle, which means that stick to what was decided earlier. So coming back to the concept of persuasive precedent, precedents may, persuasive precedents may or may not be applied. So that apart, they may be persuasive authorities that may be utilized in a case, for example, particular law reference book or a journal. Now, apart from that, a judicial precedent has two components or judicial precedent comprises of two parts. Normally when a judgment is passed, okay, if the if the lawyer wants to put it before the judge saying that in such a such a case this was a decision so he's trying to persuade the judge to you know uh, adjudicate and give a judgment in his favor so the lawyer basically will point out to the ratio decidendi of the case that what is ratio decidendi so coming to this part the, the a judicial precedent has got two components one is ratio decidendi and orbiter dicta also called as orbiter dicta now, of these two components, ratio descendendi is a very important part. Ratio descendendi is something, uh, uh, you know, which every lawyer looks at or every judge looks at. Ratio descendendi means it is the rationale, the rationale behind or the reasoning behind a particular case, how the judge has drawn this, this particular conclusion, how he has come to this conclusion, why he has come to this conclusion. So that is the basic ratio decidendi. That means the rationale, R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-E, the rationale. The rationale behind the case is ratio decidendi. Apart from that is orbiter dicta, which is persuasive in nature. These are just the revolving factors around the case, which may be persuasive in nature that has normally led the judge to a particular conclusion. So let's see what the slide says. Ratio descendendi is a rationale behind the case or the reasoning involved that made the judge to, to draw a particular conclusion and adjudicate accordingly. So ratio descendendi is basically binding in nature. Ratio descendendi is a very important component of a precedent. Precedent comprises of two components. Ratio descendendi and arbiter dicta. Ratio descendendi is binding in nature, the rationale behind the case, and arbiter dicta is persuasive in nature. They are basically, or dicta or dictum, arbiter dicta or arbiter dictum. They're the revolving factors in the case which are persuasive in nature that has led the judge to draw a particular conclusion. So arbiter dictum, or dicta by its very nature is not binding, but is merely persuasive in nature. So what are the advantages of using judicial proceedings? The one basic advantage which the entire world agrees or legal fraternity in the world agrees is that it brings about uniformity. It brings about certainty in judgments. It helps the lawyers to put forth their case and to lead the judges to come to a conclusion based on the principle of stare decisis saying that, look, it has been decided earlier, please, we request you also to decide in the same manner. So it brings about uniformity and certainty in judgments. Next, it lays down guidelines for subsequent cases. So the other cases, it tries to lay down, lay down some guidelines, but this are, these are all practical advantages of judicial proceedings, practically when you use it in the courts. So this is how a lawyer benefits out of judicial proceedings of or the decisions that are laid down by the other courts so it helps a lawyer to put forth his case and to you know to persuade a judge to uh, you know bring a uh, to you know to pass a judgment in his favor saying that it has been decided in the earlier case so you are also bound to you know apply it in this particular case but mind you what actually has to be considered is the facts should be similar 
as in the earlier case. Dissimilar facts may be considered as a persuasive precedent, but if the facts are similar and it is passed by a higher court or of the court of equal jurisdiction, then it is considered to be as a binding precedent. Now, this is, of course, it has a practical approach. It may be exhaustive, but it is, you know, uh, it has its basis in reasoning. So what are the disadvantages of judicial precedent? The disadvantages, of course, is complexity in using, you know, sometimes in case of complex cases and it uh, you know, gets difficult for a lawyer to really to break up the case and to, you know, to break it into bits to explain the case and how it is useful in any particular case. And sometimes it may be rigid at times and not really flexible. But doctrine of precedent is a very important doctrine. Judicial precedents comprise you know, major chunk of common law uh, system. That's why we say that the common law system, the, what is the common law system? England, Australia. So this is common law system, India. So the common law system, basically, it is mostly a judicial precedent-based system, or therefore we call it as, you know, they, they are the judge-made law system. Laws are basically made by the judges. Of course, they have the legislature. We have the parliament house, which normally legislates, which makes laws. But normally what happens when it comes to the courts, the laws that are passed by the parliament are interpreted by the courts. The courts have the authority to interpret the courts, like just like legal realism that some somehow that kind of theory is used where legal realistic approach is used practical approach a pragmatic approach is used where they interpret the laws judges are given the leverage to interpret the laws within the purview of the law are not trespassing his limit as you know a judicial person his limit uh, you know, because we believe in the doctrine of separation of powers. Any common law system normally believes in the doctrine of separation of powers. What is doctrine of separation of powers? Doctrine of separation of powers basically is where each authority has to act within its own realm or within its own boundary. Like you have basic three authorities is the legislature, judiciary, and the executive. The role of the legislature is to make laws. The role of the judiciary is to adjudicate matters and the role of the executive is to you know, execute laws. Example of the executive body is, of course, the police department. You know, they implement the laws. Then you have the judiciary, of course, you know, judiciary adjudicates and the legislature makes laws. So the doctrine of separation of power says that each of these wings are independent wings and you're not to trespass the, you know, the rights and the duties of each other. However, you are to coordinate with one another. So sometimes what happens, there is a kind of uh, intermingling, intermingling of, uh, you know, kind of uh, not duties, I would say rather in, in the pursuit of uh, performing their duties. Sometimes there is a little bit of, um, you know, uh, where uh, a little bit of intermingling or kind of uh, kind of uh, uh, a union between the two wings of the government or the uh, two authorities of the government. We sometimes see when the laws are passed. So it is the duty of the judge to interpret the laws. So in the pursuit of interpretation, sometimes they get a little bit forward and they try to give the meaning of the laws. So are you understanding? So sometimes they are kind of kind of uh, you know. Uh, they clash, I wouldn't say clash also, I would say that they kind of meet somewhere. Somewhere there is a meeting point between the two uh, wings of the government or the two authorities which are part of the government, that is judiciary and legislature. Uh, li likewise, there are several meeting points like we'll do in some other class if it is there for your, I mean, your syllabus, the doctrine of separation of powers. But coming back to this is about judicial precedence, what we're trying to say is, Judges normally they interpret the laws, so that is a realistic approach, that is a pragmatic approach, and that also comes within the legal realistic approach. So under legal realistic theory or realism theory, that, that theory gives the leverage to a judge saying that you can go ahead and interpret the laws and you have you know the discretion to give the entire meaning for the laws so that you adjudicated well and you come up with a proper solution and a proper judgment in the best interest of securing justice. So this is all with the doctrine of precedent. Uh, suppose this meeting ends, then we will join back. Suppose it gets over. We'll try to finish it up before that.
um, I try to, you know, summarize this chapter and make it very, very simple for you. Okay. I just try to make it very simple. I just divide it into three. That is what is very important for you in this chapter that you need to really study and learn and what is required for you to learn practically. One is what is legal realistic theory and you see somewhere it is, you know, it is connected even to the doctrine of precedent. Somewhere it is connected. What is legal reasoning? Legal reasoning can be analogical reasoning or, you know, deductive reasoning or it can be inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is something which is related to causation. That means it, it normally speaks about the cause effect theory. So that is inductive. So what is deductive? You, how you deduce, you come to a conclusion. And then analogical theory, that you study the entire circumstances, you study the entire case, and you form the reasoning and then decide upon that reasoning how you would conclude upon the matter. So the, these are the, uh, these are you know uh, the the principles of legal reasoning: analogical reasoning, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, or causation reasoning. And then we have studied about the doctrine of precedent and all these factors. Somewhere they are related to one another. Do you have any questions? No, yes. We have no question. Very good. Okay. So you understood what is judicial precedent. You understand that it is basically the, the judgments which are laid down by the courts. And you also understand the judgments which are passed by the higher court is binding on the lower court. The judgments which are passed by the courts of equal jurisdiction may not be binding, but they may be persuasive, right? Foreign judgments are persuasive in nature. Judicial precedents have basically two components. One is rash, uh, the sun ratio decidendi, but that means the rationale behind the case, the reasoning behind the case, and orbiter dicta or orbiter dictum. So this, these are important points in this chapter. Doctrine of judicial precedent is very, very important. Okay. So, so I think it's quite clear. You have no questions on that. So with that, we finish the second chapter. I want you to just go through my slides when I send it to you and also the notes. If you want, you can add ad additional points to it by referring to the other books or you know you have the reference book. You can add additional points, but these are the basics that you cannot deviate from. So these are the, the points that I've given you is something that has to be there in your answer. You can build around the points. There is no harm, but I mean, this is it. You know, you might find a little bit of commentary in some other textbooks, but the principles, I have just covered the principles. Are you understanding me? Um, so 4th of April, you'll have to submit your assignment. Okay, we are fully understand what you said to us. So the principle we should do. Okay. 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 So uh, 4th of April, you'll have to be submitting your assignment. And so get ready for that. This is just a gentle reminder. And I just take your attendance. There is Abdul Qadir, Abdul Rahman, Abdullahi, Aisha, Isay, and Naima. So that's it. All six of you are there. So attendance will be granted. So thank you. That's all from my side. And uh, good night. Since you don't have any questions as well, you can disperse and we meet again for Wednesday class, that is the law of torts. And uh, I've sent you Rylands versus Fletcher. I sent you the YouTube link. Please go through the YouTube links just to understand the case. I'm talking about the law of torts. Okay, so we meet the same time, but now Wednesday. Bye-bye. Oh.